Hi everyone, I'm Philip J. Watt, the host of the Redesigning Society podcast. Now before we get into the interview with Greg Braden, I just wanted to make a quick note because there are some audio issues in the first five minutes or so. You'll hear them, but we'll clear them up pretty quickly. So hold tight because this interview is action-packed of juicy information that you don't want to miss. Uh, Not just about what's going on currently, but also historically and as we move into potential futures, potential timelines as well. So thanks for listening. I really do appreciate you being here and supporting this podcast. If you like what you hear, please subscribe through iTunes, SoundCloud, or any of your other podcast apps. Go and check out Season 1 of this podcast, as well as the previous interviews in Season 2. There's so much great information on so many different levels, trying to help build a more conscious collective and a more conscious individual for both myself and also uh, helping others to assist themselves uh, to empower and enlighten themselves as we move into the new era, the new consciousness of humanity. So uh, you can also subscribe through my YouTube channel, The Conscious Society. That houses all of these interviews as well as some other micro docs and other stuff that I've done there. You can check out my website, pushingthetippingpoint.com, as well as Vitality Guidance for more personal development needs. Pushingthetippingpoint.com houses most of my articles relating to societal change, philosophical introspection and also personal development as well and if you'd like to stay up to date with my work you can follow me at philip j watt which is my facebook page and over the next couple of months i will be releasing my first book it's a novel called the simulation obviously that's in reference to the simulation theory not that i'm necessarily advocating that theory so you'll have to check out the book to see what uh, the message really is but it does speak to so much of what we talk about here with greg and in my other interviews as well as what my own journey of healing and growth has all been about and so i really look forward to bringing that to the world for me personally i see it as the next upgrade to the celestine prophecy because it really does speak to not just what's going on in the synchronicity and connection and the esoterica that we experience in this magical mad world, uh, but also does talk about the serious social and systemic issues as well. So there's lots of realism, lots of subtle implicit messages encoded throughout the book. So if you're interested, keep an eye out for that. Otherwise, thanks again for being here. Thanks for pressing play. And I really hope you enjoyed this interview with Mr. Greg Brighton. Hi guys and girls, I'm your host Philip J. Watt and welcome back to the Redesigning Society podcast. Today's guest is Greg Braden who I interviewed about a year or a year and a half ago on season one of the podcast and it's an absolute pleasure to have Greg back uh, to talk about what's going on in the world of uh, cycles, science, spirituality and so many juicy topics. So uh, for those who aren't aware of Greg's work, uh, he is a five-time New York uh, five-time New York Times best-selling author, and is internationally renowned as a pioneer in bridging science, spirituality, and human potential. And that, to me, is very, very much related to the work that I do, and I'm very fond of the work that uh, Greg does in this the, those areas. Uh, from 1979 to 1990, Greg worked for Fortune 500 companies such as Cisco Systems. Phillips Petroleum and Martin Moretta Aerospace is a problem solver during times of crisis. And don't we have times of crisis right now? He continues problem solving today as he weaves modern science and the wisdom preserved in remote monasteries and forgetting texts into real world solution. His discoveries has, has led to 12 award winning books now published in over 40 languages. The United Kingdom's Watkins Journal lists Greg among the top 100 of the world's most spiritually influential living people for the fifth uh, consecutive year, and he is a 2017 nominee 
for the prestigious Temple Award, t- uh, sorry, Templeton Award. This award was established in 1972 by the late Sir John Templeton to honour outstanding individuals who have devoted their talents to expanding our vision of human purpose and ultimate reality. And don't we need many more people like Greg who are contributing to that process? Uh, a few of his uh, publications that you might be aware of, his first was Awakening to Zero Point, The Collective Initiation, The God Code, uh, The Secret of Our Past, The Promise of Our Future. Uh, Unleashing the Power of the God Code was uh, an addition to that, and The Divine Matrix, Bridging Time, Space, Miracles and Belief, Fractal Time, Entang- uh, Fractal Time The Secrets of 2012 and A New Age, Entanglement, a, ta- a Tales of Everyday Magic Novel, and I will get into some magical questions a little bit later. And his most recent book, Human by Design, which I haven't read, I will admit to doing that, but I look forward to reading it. And he describes this book as the biggest crisis we are currently facing is a crisis of thinking. And don't I know that? The philosophical uh, suffering that people are undertaking within themselves leads to all this uh, manifest, manifested behavioral and emotional uh, uh, suffering as an extent because we are lost in an ideological uh, world of warfare at the moment where belief systems are causing conflict on a material level but also an internal level as well. Uh, he continues, the stories that we tell us about ourselves and believe define the way we answer the question of how we came to be and how we live our future, i.e. disease, healing, relationship, romance, future of our planet, and survival of our species. New DNA evidence suggests that we're the result of, uh, we're the result and intentional act of creation that has imbued us with extraordinary abilities of intuition, compassion, empathy, love, and self-healing. Free yourself from the paradigm of lonely insignificance and move into one of possessing an extraordinary and rare heritage. And that's where this book begins. So that sounds like an amazing synopsis of uh, a very good read. Um, and I'd just like to get into it without further ado. Greg, welcome back to the Redesigning Society podcast. Philip, it's really great to hear your voice. I'm absolutely thrilled to be with you and your community, my community. I guess it's our community we're sharing today. Hey, I want to let you off the hook for not having read this book because it was only released less than one week ago. So, so not many people have read this book because it simply wasn't available. So uh, thank you for having me on. We you know, my sense is uh, this is such a huge and intimate topic. I, I think our time together is going to go by very quickly today, and I'm, I'm just going to follow your lead, and let's see where we go. Absolutely. I think we'll get into human by design a little bit later, uh, but I just want to start off with some of the basics. You know, a lot of people don't know your work, uh, but also mm. we get familiar with people, and we forget about some of that basic information uh, that can help build our understanding of our relationship to you and what and your work, but also our relationship to ourselves. So am I right to think that a major theme that sort of permeates your work is relationships? So relationships to ourselves, relationships to people, relationships to community, and relationships to reality at large. Sure, Phillips. Well, I mean, after all, what else is life about? It's, it's about us. Uh, and the way we think of ourselves, the way we feel about ourselves, and how those thoughts and feelings are reflected in our relationships. And whether we are consciously aware of them or not, the reality is that life is constantly informing us of what our deepest beliefs really are. Sometimes they're conscious beliefs, a lot of times they're subconscious, but that doesn't mean we can't know about them, because what we claim to be true about ourselves and our, and our hearts and our minds, it comes back to us on a daily basis through our relationships with coworkers, with siblings, with, um, <clears throat> with loved ones, with spouses. The, the most intimate relationships we have is where we will obviously learn the, the deepest insights into what it is that, that we truly believe. So yes, it is accurate to say that. Uh, however, where I may be a little different from uh, some other very skilled people in this field who are doing something very similar uh, is I'm a scientist. Uh, I was trained as a scientist. I'm an earth scientist by degree. I'm a degree geologist. But what I found in studying the sciences uh, is that it's impossible to separate us from those sciences. You can't separate us from the earth and the history of the earth. 
Uh, and I, I began, I don't know how far back you want to go, but I, I began the study of science at the age of five years old. I've been fascinated by science itself, space science, ocean science, uh, human science. Uh, and I think probably one of the most difficult choices I ever had to make in my life was which of those sciences I would pursue as a career uh, and which would become ho hobbies. And it also happened at a time in my life, a very difficult time, when um, my, family, uh, my family split. My father left when I was 10. Uh, and I also became a musician at the same time. So I had to make a choice. Am I going to make a, a living as a musician or as a scientist? And Philip, I just want to tell you why this is important to me, because at 10 years old, I wanted to change this world in a really good way. And I saw in my life, when I was 10 years old, two places where this was happening. When I would go to a rock concert, uh, my first rock concert for our listeners, this is going to date me here, <laughs> was the Jefferson Airplane in the 1960s. But what I saw at that, at that concert was I saw a stadium of about 40,000 people being moved to heart and soul by an experience that they shared collectively. And I said, I'd like to do that. But what I also saw is when the concert was over, Philip, people were left empty. They were longing to have the experience again, but they needed the music to incite the experience. They needed to buy the, at that time, it was a vinyl album to recreate the experience. So I saw that on the one hand. And on the other hand, during the 1960s, there was a, a very prominent speaker, a spiritual speaker. His name was Billy Graham. Uh, and I'm, I'm not saying that I'm on board with everything that Billy Graham said as a speaker. He was a, a religious um, and, and spiritual speaker. But I saw him move audiences of 70,000 plus in the sports stadiums in, in the city where I was born. And here's the difference. When people left a Billy Graham presentation, something had changed within them because he showed them a new way to think and a new way to see themselves in the presence of one another in their world. They didn't have to have an external experience of an album or a movie or something to create the experience. Something had shifted in them through his words. And those two experiences were very, very powerful for me. And they in many ways, they formed the direction that I chose to take in, in my life. So, so I am a, I'm still a musician. Um, I don't do it professionally any longer. Uh, I am a scientist uh, and pursue sciences and many other fields that help me to bring to the forefront the kinds of things we're talking about. And uh, my degree is as a, an earth scientist, as a geologist. So, so that's a long answer to a short question, but it helps us, it lays a foundation that we can tie into this as we go through our conversation today. Yes, absolutely. It's one of those things really with uh, research in general. There are, we, we live in a, and, and knowledge in general, we live in a compartmentalized society where careers are compartmentalized and specialized. And there's nothing wrong in, uh, about that in and of itself because it's really important that we get people to have an ex expertise in certain areas. We can't be all experts in everything. Uh, but through that process, we tend to miss a lot of the holistic understanding and holistic threads uh, that sort of permeate whatever field it m may be, including science. So a lot of the... Pro uh, the uh, empowerment process that we're going through as individuals in this day and age, not just in terms of career, but in terms of the, how we empower ourselves with information and knowledge, we tend to have to uh, uh, sort of uh, take an approach where we learn a bit about everything and try and sort of uh, all sort of collate it into this big picture for us to understand and feel with our hearts. So it, it's important for us really to look at. Um, uh, you know where we want to go in a career and 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 how we want to uh, specialize in life but do you think it's also equally important to get that holistic understanding am i right well i i, I personally believe everything you're, you're saying is true philip and this is this is what's happening in western society i'm not saying it's only in america or only in the uk or only in australia but i'm saying there's a, a movement a tendency uh to to leave many of the sciences out of the curricula, number one, and number two, uh, to negate the new discoveries 
that science is revealing. And this is important because science is not a static study. Science is dynamic. It's designed to be constantly updated as new discoveries come to light. And the story that we tell ourselves about ourselves, the story that we base our lives upon, the story that, that, that determines the kind of relationships that we create, who we invite into our lives, how long those relationships work, uh, the way that we heal our bodies, uh, the kind of careers and jobs we feel worthy of pursuing, that our self-esteem tells us that we are worthy of all of those, as different as those things are from one another, the common thread that runs through all of them is that they're all the product of the way we're taught to think about ourselves and our relationship to the world. Science is constantly updating what we know about ourselves and our relationship to the world on the one hand. And on the other hand, there is a reluctance, uh, and I'm personally encountering a resistance in the mainstream to share the new discoveries that change the way we think about ourselves in, in a positive way. There's a story out there. And universities, academia, corporations, religious institutions, and politicians are fighting to keep that story in place. It's a story that w has been with us for, for a generation now, moving on into a new generation. It's a story of powerlessness, of us being insignificant in the world. Uh, it's a story, in my opinion, that denigrates the value of human life. And Philip, when we, when we look into the world and we see the things that are happening in the world, whether we're talking about terrorism in any of our countries, and we're all experiencing it now, or the atrocities that we see humans committing against other humans in wartime. You know, if, if you read the stories of people coming back from the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan and what's happening in the Middle East, it goes beyond people simply killing one another. They go out of their way to brutalize one another. And we're also seeing it happen domestically with drug abuse, domestic abuse, and hate based upon religion, the color of our skin, uh, and our, our, um, uh, our sexual orientation. All of these things are based upon the way we think about ourselves and the denigration of, of human life. Because in a society where human life was valued and honored, which, by the way, is supported by the new discoveries we're going to talk about, where human life is honored, uh, you would never see a human treat another human in that way. It's because we've been conditioned through the educational process of the last 150 years, from the time of Charles Darwin, to, to see ourselves as separate, uh, to see nature uh, as a, a nature, a force based in competition, conflict, struggle. Uh, and we believe that. And we believe that it applies in our lives on the one hand. The other hand, the new science is telling us that it simply isn't true. Yet there is uh, a resistance to sharing those discoveries in the mainstream. So uh, all of my work is about these topics in one form or another. The most recent book really hones in on the new discoveries uh, that are helping us to, to build a new human story. And there is a new human story emerging. It's, it's a beautiful, powerful story of hope and possibility, but it's only available if we embrace the best science of the modern world. So um, again, long answer to short question, but the answer is, is yes. I, I think these things are very, very important. Yeah, well, there's no doubt that the corporatocracy is having an impact on the way that human uh, sort of... Uh, sort of relationships and to themselves and each other developed, including with walls and whatnot, uh, war, you know, warfare uh, over the, you know, especially the last century, but well beyond, you know, there's, there's certainly uh, benefits to the ruling class, you know, for those sorts of uh, behaviors, especially mm -hmm. from a profit-based perspective. Uh, but just going back to your previous thoughts around the story that they've been, um, that the, that is, dominant in our current era and i'm assuming you're referring to scientific materialism or philosophical materialism which really has hardened into a dogma over the last century or even a couple of centuries but as you've talked about new discoveries in science the new sciences looking at quantum physics and consciousness it tells a different story it tells a different story of not separation but connection of not disempowerment and meaninglessness but empowerment and meaning in this world. 
So the, the basic discussion that's happening within the realm of independent thinkers is it's sort of this debate or this dichotomy between materialism and idealism, but also thrown into that mix is animism. The re-enchantment of our world, of spirit, of, of energy has, uh, has really started to take hold um, mm. with so many people. And it's just beautiful to watch the magic manifest uh, when you have those the eyes, when you see through your heart and you, and you see the reverence and you see the awe. So from a, from a philosophical perspective, we'll move into the new discoveries and the new science, but where do you sit in terms of fo- your philosophy on life in general? Well, I'm, I'm going to take about a half a step back, and I, I just want to clarify something that, that I said a little earlier. Uh, the way that we think about ourselves and the, uh, the society that we now have is largely rooted in discoveries that were published uh, over 150 years ago. 1859, Charles Darwin published a book that was titled The Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection. Uh, and one of the interesting things as I researched that book, one of the interesting things I found is he actually wrote it, Philip, Uh, over 20 years prior to the time it was released. And he he consciously chose to release it later in his life because he knew of the flack that he was going to catch from primarily from the religious institutions of 1859, from the Catholic Church. He knew that he was going to get hammered for these ideas, and he opted to receive that hammering, (laughs) if you will, later later in life. So I I want to be really clear about... um, my perspective with that information, people ask me all the time. They say, you know, Greg, that was, it was 150 years ago. Sure, maybe it was important then, but what difference could it possibly make in our lives today? And it's a really good question. And the answer surprises a lot of people because the the world that we live in now, the society that we experience, the model for economy, the economic models for nations and between nations, the way that corporations are built, the way that industries are constructed, uh, all harken back to the thinking uh, of late 1800s, early 1900s, when these institutions were developed. So yeah, we're in the 21st century, that's true, and we are still living Uh, in a society based upon principles that were developed in the late 1800s, early 1900s, when Darwin's ideas were embraced, they were accepted widely because he was a scientist. Uh, By the way, Darwin was also a geologist. Uh, So this is, as a geologist, he was looking at at life. So my perspective, I want to be really clear on this. I have a lot of respect for Charles Darwin as a man. It was a different world in 1859. And as I read his books and his papers, I felt like I got to know him a little bit. And what he very clearly said was he never intended his theories to be the theories that would last forever. He fully expected that his theories would be overturned. When new discoveries were revealed, he said that his theories were simply a stepping stone. They were a bridge to move us into a new way of, of thinking about ourselves away from religion and away from, from the Catholic Church. So Darwin was okay if his theories were overturned. It's, it's the academia and the corporations and the politicians today that are not okay with it. He fully expected that. So, so he, and Darwin could not possibly have known in his day what we now know in ours. He didn't know about DNA. Uh, he didn't understand the biology the way that is understood today, or the physics, the quantum nature of our reality. So he did the best he could with what he had during the time. It moved us from the stagnation of where we were in 1859. It got us going. And and now the new discoveries are moving us yet again. Uh, Yet there is a reluctance, uh, as I mentioned, to to embrace those new discoveries. So uh, I don't believe, and this is where I'm, maybe I'm a, a little different from some of my colleagues, I don't look at our past as a mistake, Philip. I, I believe that we're in, in uh, an evolutionary process, uh, that we build upon the knowledge of, of previous generations. We do the best we can with what we know in the moment. The only place that I could fault our societies, our civilization, is in the reluctance to embrace 
the new discoveries that lead us in a healthy, positive direction uh, rather than, than choosing to remain stagnant in the old stories that may have worked for us in the past. But here's the thing. The world is changing, and we all know that. So when the world changes, we've got to change the way we think and to, to try to embrace the thinking of 15 and 20 years ago or, or beyond, to try to solve the problems of today with the thinking that we had in the 1980s or 1990s, it doesn't work. And we know that. Uh, and what we're seeing is uh, very powerful nations. It's like putting a square peg in a round hole. They're, they're still trying to use the old ways of thinking to solve the problems. And because they're not working, they're trying harder. So they're going with bigger tactics, bigger arsenals, more sophisticated military equipment, but the thinking is still the same and it simply isn't working. So this is why the basis for the new book, Human by Design, this is why I think it's important to be honest with ourselves. How can we possibly solve the problems of our world and of our own lives? I mean, where do we draw the line between our personal lives and, and the problems in our society or our culture or, or our nation? It's pretty hard to do that. So if we're going to solve those problems, how can we do it unless we're honest with ourselves about who we are and our relationships with the world, with one another, with the past, with the future, with our own bodies? And, uh, and that's why I think it is so important to embrace this new story. And, and we have this opportunity, Philip. This is, I'm very excited about this. We have teachers who are now asking for this new information to be made available in the public schools so that we can raise a new generation of young people with a thinking that reflects the deepest truths of our existence. The fact, number one, that nature is based upon cooperation and what biologists call mutual aid rather than competition and conflict. You know, we all see the competition. We're not denying it's there. But the science is showing us the more competition we see, the more conflict, the further we have strayed from the truest law of nature. So what would it be like to raise an entire generation of young people steeped in the belief that nature actually likes them and is friendly, steeped in, in the knowledge that we are connected to ourselves, to one another, and to the earth, steeped in the story that we are uniquely designed to self-regulate our bodies in the presence of this changing world so that we can thrive in the changes. Now, this is exciting me. What would it mean to, to have an entire generation of young people with that shift in thinking? Uh, I don't know, but I think we're about to find out because this is where the energy is moving right now. Well said, very well said. Yeah, you talk about uh, cycles a lot, don't you? And the, you talk about the uh, three primary cycles converging in this current era which is of the climate, of economy, and of conflict. Uh, mm -hmm. what's, your, what's your basis, just for those who don't understand what cycles are and, and how we live in a cyclical uh, universe sure. of reality, what, what's your uh, evidential basis for cycles being um, you know, primary to the way that reality works, as well as how the three cycles convergence is unfolding now and into the, you know, the short and midterm future? Well, sure, Philip, we could do an entire program uh, based on the answer to the question <laughs> that you just asked me. So I, let me, I'll just begin by saying um, uh, I am a scientist, as I mentioned, a degree geologist. I've got a background in physics, math, ocean sciences, and computer science. So that all comes together to, to help me to interpret the new discoveries that are revealed in, in diverse branches of science. Uh, they're usually published in very obscure publications. You know, you don't, you don't see them in, you know, Time Magazine or, or uh, you know, the New York Times. You see these in these obscure publications. So as a scientist, uh, I'm also what is called a systems thinker. So I tend to step back, look at the big, big picture of how everything works from a, a wide angle. And then once I have that understanding clearly, uh, I step in to that picture, into the nano moment of my life within the context of that big cycle. And I, I think we all tend to do that to some degree, maybe not consciously. 
but we like to know how things work so that we know how we fit in those things that work. So having said that, when I look at, at the world uh, as I see it today, you know, if you watch the mainstream news, what they're telling you is that they are very myopic. They focus on one topic. They say, if you can just cut the carbon emissions, you know, the climate is going to go back to where it was 20 years ago. If we can just solve the debt problem of the world, the economy is going to be okay. What they are missing is that climate and global debt, peak debt, as it's being called, human conflict, these are all facets of a, a shift, of a cyclic change that you can only be aware of when you look at this big picture. Uh, and depending on how deep you go, I'll tell you, for me, it begins with understanding Earth's relationship uh, in space to the sun uh, and uh, in our Milky Way galaxy. And, and what I can say to you is that Earth, uh, <laughs> when I was in school back in the 1950s and 60s, I was shown pictures of Earth orbiting the sun, and it looked like a, a perfect circle of Earth orbiting around the sun, very neat and clean diagrams, and now we know nothing could be further from the truth. Earth does a dance in space. It is based on the tilt, the angle, and the wobble of our planet as it orbits around our sun. And as Earth goes through, shifts in the tilt, the angle, and the wobble as it relates to the sun, those shifts change the way that we live on our planet. Uh, and this is very well known in, um, in many scientific circles. I've documented it in uh, the book Resilience from the Heart. I documented it in some of the other book, Deep Truth. I documented this. Uh, so what we know, and as a geologist, uh, I think is fascinating because it's those relationships, the, the tilt, the angle, and the wobble that also have driven climate change in the past before humans were ever creating CO2 on this planet. So we're definitely creating a lot of CO2. We're definitely harming the planet. We definitely need to get off fossil fuels. Uh, we could have done that 60 years ago. We've had the technology to uh, replace fossil fuels with non-fossil fuel energy, with non-combustible energy for over 60 years, if we were really serious about, about doing these things. So what I know is that the climate changes are based upon rhythms and cycles over vast periods of time, and we're living one of those now, so that is one of the cycles. Economic cycles uh, follow the same mathematical rhythms as, as the, the climate cycles do, which is interesting. Um, and we can chart, I talk about those in the book, Resilience from the Heart. We, we are ending an economic cycle that began in 1949. It ended uh, in the year 2015, 2016, and we're beginning a new cycle. And the economy of the world today is right on track with what those cycles tell us is happening. But if we don't know where we are, we think that there's something happening that's never happened before. If, if we're thinking about money the way we were 10 years ago, we're out of the loop because money does not mean the same thing now that it meant 10 years ago. I talk about that in the books as well. Human conflict. Uh, I had the opportunity to, to speak at the United Nations in New York with uh, my dear friend uh, and colleague, Dr. Bruce Lipton, uh, wrote the book Biology of Belief. And Bruce and I were invited to speak at the UN, uh, offering our perspectives in terms of trends and cycles for our world and what we can expect so that the UN can help to prepare for that, so they know where to allocate resources, um, uh, time, energy, uh, money. And Bruce is a life scientist, me as a, as a physical scientist, an earth scientist. Uh, we both talked about these cycles. So human conflict follows the rhythms and cycles that I'm describing. Uh, and for many people, that's a surprise. They, they think that human conflict just happens whenever it happens. What we know, the bottom line now, the science is telling us when the magnetic fields of our planet are low, human society is more aggressive. We are less cooperative as individuals. Uh, we are more aggressive. And this has been documented, proven time and again. When the magnetic fields are stronger, we are much willing, more willing to cooperate. We are much more, uh, much less aggressive. And you can follow the rhythms of these through the great wars of the past, the beginnings and the ends. When the war ends, when it begins, they follow these rhythms and cycles almost to a T. So the reason I'm saying this now is because all three of these cycles are converging 
in a way that we've never seen before in our lifetime. So climate, economy, conflict, all converging right now. Uh, and the, the, the conflict part is, happens to be front and center right now. Sometimes the climate is front and center as with the, the big storms in, uh, in Mexico and in, in the US uh, just a few weeks ago. Uh, sometimes the economy is front and center. Sometimes two or more of these cycles will converge and both of them are front and center. But the, the point of this is that we are in a vulnerable time. The experts call it a time of extremes. And to thrive, and it is possible to thrive in the extremes, we've got to shift our thinking rather than looking at what is happening in our world as anomalies and waiting for everything to get back to normal. If we can embrace what the science is showing us, that we're living the new normal and we've got to shift our thinking in order to embrace it, then uh, we begin to think and live very, very differently. And it is possible to thrive in these times of extremes. So the conflict, uh, right now, we are in a very low point in the magnetic field of Earth based on solar cycles. Uh, our listeners that are familiar with solar cycles and magnetic fields in the sun, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. The sun is very quiet right now. The magnetic fields are low. And this low vulnerability will peak in the year 2020, began right around the year 2014 in earnest. So until the year 2020, which is, you know, just a couple of years from now, we are vulnerable. We are susceptible to conflict. It doesn't, I want to be really clear about this. It doesn't mean that we must have conflict. We are not slaves to the cycles. It means that we are just what I said. We are vulnerable. And because of that, we can be more conscious in our communication, more mindful in our relationships. This is for individuals as well as between nations. We can give our adversaries the benefit of a doubt. We can extend that olive branch uh, in a really very kind way during this time of vulnerability because it also, Philip, becomes the greatest opportunity for peace. Not only are we living a time of vulnerability in terms of conflict, but the flip side is that these vulnerabilities can become, and they have in the past, become the greatest times of peace. World War II ended in precisely the kind of cycle that we're in right now. World War I ended in the same kind of cycle. So uh, it's in the ability to see the big picture, number one, and number two, where we fit into that big picture, it gives us an empowered perspective. Uh, and for me, it's, it's a powerful message, a lot of good news in this message, because we already have all of the big solutions to the big problems in the world. We've already got those solutions. We know how to create energy with zero fossil fuels. We know how to build economies based upon sharing and cooperation rather than scarcity and conflict. We know how to heal every organ in the human body, even organs we were told could not heal because uh, this has now been demonstrated under laboratory conditions. It's all about the environment of, of the body. We know how to produce the food to feed every mouth of every, every man, every woman, every child on the face of the earth. A lack of food is not the reason that our global family is starving in places today in the 21st century and places on the earth today. A lot of good news. The key is we've got to think differently to make room in our lives for that news that already exists. So that is the foundation for every book that I've written. And each book explores a different facet. And this newest book uh, does so as well, helping us to, to think of ourselves differently within the context of, of these big changes. Yes, very well said. I've been long a advocate of uh, helping people to uh, communicate a little bit more uh, nurturing when they, when they do with people, especially on the internet. There's so much anger and hatred and, and just, just general um, attacking um, against each other just because someone might have a different belief or whatnot. But what I've always encouraged people to do since I started writing is to communicate in a way that uh, doesn't get sucked into that conflict. It's, you really, we really need to be be aware that all right. There's a lot of people who are still thinking within the lines of the old paradigm, and even those who are waking up into new ways of thinking and feeling and behaving still have a, a long way to go. We all have a long way to go. It's a journey of awakening, not a destination of waking up. 
And through that process, we need to be kind with each other and, and actually understand that people are, are subject to their traumas and their uh, dysfunctions and their poor wiring and all the other stuff that uh, manifests these sort of aggressive type, um, you know, conflictual behaviours. And if we really want to look towards a new era for humanity, then we need to, as that say, uh, old, you know, that adage goes, be the change. Uh, mm. We need to literally be that change and show to people there is another way to communicate and 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 uh, cooperate with each other. And, and be the leader in your own life for helping to facilitate that change, uh, both internally and externally. Now, you, there's so many things that you talk about, Greg, that I've got all these notes and I might go on weird tangents here and there because I want to touch on all these things. Um, but just quickly on the Schumann's resonance, um, it's peaked into some are calling it the gamma range. But uh, for those who don't know, the Schumann resonance uh, measures um, uh, the electromagnetic sort of uh, waves in the atmosphere and, uh, and it's usually at a, a pulse rate or a frequency rate of about 7.8 hertz but it's uh, really um, amped up over the last several years in over 30 hertz so how do, you fit, how do you see that fitting into the cycles and what impact does that have on human individual conscious, consciousness and human collective consciousness? Well, we've already answered the question in the last question without saying those words specifically. What Schumann, it's called the Schumann cavity resonance. Uh, it is essentially measuring uh, the, the magnetic fields of our planet are reflected in this, what's called the Schumann cavity uh, that surrounds the Earth. And this is where it gets a little tricky, and, and I just want to clarify uh, what this is. There is no single Schumann frequency they are uh, they occur simultaneously in at different frequencies. So, the, so the base resonant frequency of the Earth is that seven point eight cycles per second, or, or seven point eight hertz. The next level is is the uh, an integer multiple of that. It's right around fifteen cycles per second, and the next is right around that thirty cycle per second range, and it continues. And what happens, Philip, is throughout Earth's history there are times when one of these frequencies becomes more dominant. So it's not that the, the whole thing shifts. It's one of them pops out to be more dominant and others are, are less dominant. And right now, uh, it is between that 15 and 30 hertz range, uh, for whatever reason, appears to be more dominant right now. So it influences human populations. It influences societies. There are a lot of research papers uh, about this, the Institute of Heart Math is a pioneering research organization in uh, uh, Northern California. For our, our listeners that may not be familiar with them, it's H E A R T, capital M A T H, all one word, Heart Math. And they have, if you're really interested in this stuff, they have a number of uh, published, peer reviewed uh, technical research papers you can see on their website, www.heartmath.org that will give you probably more than you'd ever want to know. Uh, but the bottom line is what we just said. When the magnetic fields of the earth are strong, we are less aggressive and more willing to cooperate. And HeartMath is exploring ways to create that magnetic strength through human consciousness. And we have a lot of data showing that we do this all the time. We simply don't know it. Uh, the, the, the big the big shift for scientists came after September 11th, 2001, when the satellites measured a tremendous spike in the magnetic fields of the Earth. The strength of Earth's magnetic fields spiked uh, beginning about 15 minutes after the first plane hit the first tower of the World Trade Center. And the scientists attribute that spike to the outpouring of heart-based emotion from hundreds of millions of people all over the world who were watching 9-11 on their televisions. So the key is the heart is the strongest magnetic, biomagnetic generator in the human body. The heart is much stronger than the brain, uh, both electrically and magnetically. So essentially what happened was within 15 minutes of that first plane hitting the first tower on 9-11, hundreds of millions of human hearts were pumping their magnetic contribution to the, con to the, the field of, of Earth 
and actually spiked, strengthened the magnetic field of the Earth. Here's why that's important. If you remember, and if our listeners remember, for at least a few days after 9-11, the human population in Western society became very close. People talked to one another that don't typically talk. They looked at one another in the eyes. They hugged one another on the streets. And for at least a couple of days, we were truly a family during that time. And then everything went back to the way we always know it. Scientists attribute that closeness to the strength of this magnetic field uh, and the, the relationship it has to human society and to, to uh, human, human psyche and human emotions. So we know that we have the ability to influence the magnetic field of a planet. The question is, can we do it without having a tragedy to respond to? And this is where the research from the Institute of Heart Math is coming in. So we could go on and on about that, but I just I want to say for people that are interested in knowing more about this, there is a program. It's called GCI, Global Coherence Initiative, uh, that has been formed to help us replicate the effects without having the tragedy of 9-11 uh, at a time when we need less aggression and when we need more cooperation. And that project is actually uh, happening right now. So, um, so we could, uh, I'll stop there because I know we want to go on to some other things, but this is, uh, it's, it's where science and spirituality and everyday life and human potential all come together in a really beautiful way, Philip, because the science is confirming through the mathematics what we intuitively sense is true, and that is that we are deeply connected to this planet and that we are not victims and we are not powerless when it comes to directing what happens in our lives, what happens in our world, and where we go with the future of this planet. So we are awakening to, number one, the possibility, and then number two, the responsibility. What do we do with this newfound understanding and we're all answering that question right now it really does inspire us i mean the, the key word there is potential you know we live in a quantum uh, world of potentiality that we manifest as actual particles experience both individually and collectively and when we look at that collective impact we have uh, on our environment uh, and shaping our reality uh, it really does show us and illustrate what we could potentially achieve it's almost almost beyond our imagination because we're so used to this little box this little era that we've been exposed to of separateness and and division and all these uh lower virtues lower vibrational emotional and consciousness states uh, that we've been sucked into and, and we've and we've stayed sucked into uh, because of the deep programming and conditioning that uh, the way our neuro we're neurologically wired and conceptually designed, it really is difficult to break free and emancipate ourselves uh, from that uh, hard coded uh, uh, programming that we get from birth. But once we start to explore ourselves and explore new information and new ideas and open ourselves to to potentiality. We can see what what we can what we can create. Like if we are working together on that level, uh, having that uh, you know having that open hearted uh, approach to each other and the world at large, that we can really create something more authentic, more empowered. Uh, uh, instead of having sca a scarcity based system design, we can have an abundance based uh, system design. We can actually get along. Can get along. We don't have to, a lot of people believe, oh, it's just human nature to be greedy and to be selfish. And of course, those aspects of our emotional and behavioral patterns are part of the spectrum, but they're extremely accentuated in this day and age. They are mm -hmm. accentuated by a system and that they're, they're accentuated by those poor philosophical uh, paradigms that continue to uh, uh, shape who we are today. But it doesn't need to be that way. We can be so much more on so many different levels, both on an individual and a collective level. All right, so just quickly going back to the cycles and how sun affects the climate. Do you see a uh, – because, I mean, it's very brave of you to say that uh, the, the sun is impacting the, the 
climate change on this planet because we know that there is a very, very strong stance uh, in neoliberal ideology and also just general um, so-called progressives that it's just CO2. And there are arguments to suggest that CO2 isn't exactly a poison anyway and that that impact isn't extremely large. But we are, mm-hmm. have, we are having serious impact on our natural systems, including deforestation, uh, uh, ocean acidification. Um, there's all this uh, desertification as well. That's another one. We're, we're literally killing off the uh, diversity of uh, life in our ecosystems on this planet. And we need to take responsibility for that by, by taking smarter measures through it to energy and, and all the other uh, you know, resources that we do sure. need. Sure. Absolutely. Um, so it's very brave of you to say that because I know well, that it's very difficult um, f- uh, for people to be honest about that a- actually su- actual subject. Well, let, let, me, let me try. I just want to chime in here really quick and share with people. It's not that this is my opinion or my theory or my hypothesis. This is peer-reviewed science that is not being shared in the mainstream. And it's peer-reviewed science that is accepted in scientific circles where the scientists are not beholden to corporations for their grant money or university scientists are not beholden to to corporations. This is peer-reviewed science uh, that we've known uh, since the 1980s. And scientists were in agreement in the 1980s until this became a political football. And what the science is showing, this is... um, uh, from core samples, ice cores from Antarctica, for example, and from Greenland, uh, going back f- over 400,000 years, we see the rhythms and the cycles of the heating and the cooling based upon an Earth's relationship to the sun. But what we also see, Philip, that is really telling is that when the heating occurs, the heating happens before the carbon dioxide levels rise. So there's a lag time between the time the heating occurs and when the CO2 levels start to rise, that tells us that the CO2 is not the cause of the rise in the temperature. Uh, This is published in the very prestigious journal Nature, uh, in the book Deep Truth, and in the book Resilience from the Heart. Uh, I give all the technical references for all of these, so I just want to be clear. I'm simply sharing the peer-reviewed science. It's not popular in some circles today, but we can't cherry-pick the science. Uh, so, uh, and I, I also want to be very clear, we definitely need to get off fossil fuels. We need to go cr- clean, green. We need to stop burning oil. We could have done that over 60 years ago if we wanted to. If we, now I'm say, when I say we, it's not you and me and our listeners, but if the powers that be were really serious about this, we could have done this over 60 years ago. And as you mentioned, Philip, and I talk about this in the book, Uh, scientists in Norway were the first to identify what they call eight different zones or eight parameters of Earth's ecology that must be in place for us to be able to live on this planet. It's called the safe zone, S-A-F-E. So for us to have and continue the safe zone, there are eight parameters that must be honored, and climate change is only one of those parameters. Uh, the acidification of the oceans is another one, and you mentioned that. The loss of biodiversity is another one, and you mentioned that. So w- the reason I'm saying this is when we look at these eight parameters, what we see is that we have already blown right through some of them. They are off the charts. We have completely uh, violated the loss of, of biodiversity, for example, is so great it can't even be plotted on the chart and have everything else remain in in context. Uh, The CO2 is creating, uh, the oceans are becoming acidic, which means they won't support the fundamental life that the chain of life is based on. And we're not hearing about those things. So is is climate change happening? Absolutely, it is a fact. Are we the sole cause of climate change that the evidence doesn't support that? Are we contributing to the climate change? The evidence says that we probably are, through the use and the burning of fossil fuels, and there are other parameters that are not being talked about that we need to be aware of. Can we stop climate change? The evidence suggests that we are not going to stop climate change uh, in our lifetime. We're probably not gonna stop it down the road because it is part of a natural rhythm 
uh, based upon Earth's location in space. So my invitation as a geologist has been to become resilient to the change rather than trying to act like we're surprised and what's happening is an anomaly. So we are having stronger storms. Let's, for a perfect example, let's bury the power grid that is vulnerable in high winds and ice and rain and snowstorms so that when those storms come through, which is going to happen throughout our lifetimes, we are not going to be in the position that Puerto Rico is in right now where uh, uh, the population of an entire nation, a large part of that population still is without electricity 30 days after the storm went through because the infrastructure was destroyed. If that infrastructure were underground, yeah, they would still have the storm and there would still be damage, but people would have life support systems. They'd be able to refrigerate their food. It's hot and humid. They have no air conditioning. Uh, older people are dying from the heat exhaustion. The insects are, cannot be kept out because the, the windows are open, uh, you know, to, to have some, some kind of, of air movement because there's no air conditioner there. None of that would be happening if we honored what the data is telling us that we're in a time of extremes and we take the measures of resilience uh, that are required so that we can uh, meet these changes in, in a healthy way. Uh, in the book, Resilience from the Heart, I identify five levels of community resilience. The first level is, um, is the one that we call, uh, when we know something is going to happen, uh, to prepare for that rather than ignoring the information. And that essentially is what's happening with climate change right now. So, so is it a fact? It absolutely is. And, um, and I think as, as we begin to embrace this in our thinking, uh, it becomes less of a problem because we're honoring the rhythms and the cycles of, of nature. So well, we've got, uh, we're at that stage, we've got so much technological advancement as well, and we can really utilize that yeah. for, for our resilience. And, and I'd just like to say, make a comment on um, how certain science isn't making it the mainstream. And a lot of people think science is just this natural, open process, but it is very severely impacted by corporate profits and corporate funding. And also in the academ academic circles, people are looked down on for having alternative views to the standard or official sort of story, including scientific materialism. I've spoken to Rupert Sheldrake has laid that out very clear on season one of the podcast. Uh, for those who are interested in sci research and the statistically significant results that come out of uh, the way that we're, we can measure in the laboratory our connection between the internal and the, and the external is Dean Radin, and I think he's part of the Heart Math uh, Institute as well. I know you're a part of, you know, there's the three amigos, as I understand it, yourself, Bruce Lipton, and Joe Dispenza, and I'd love to get the opportunity mm. to, to uh, interview Bruce and Joe one day. Um, but you guys have, have done so much, uh, uh, collect, collated so much amazing information for us to understand all of this stuff. And it really is, um, the information really is out there. So I really encourage people to do their proper research and, and look at not how, how they can change philosophically to um, uh, further empower and advance themselves, but also how they can build that resilience uh, in their own lives. And one thing I'd like to talk about just quickly is uh, relocalizing food systems and energy systems. I mean, we can use hemp. Hemp can be used on so many different levels. It can create thousands of products, including fuel and uh, carpet and um, clothing and building materials. There's a hemp creek, uh, like a concrete that you can make from hemp. Hemp really should be utilized on a mass scale uh, because it's actually environmentally responsible and morally responsible on so many different levels, but it also provides so many of our resource needs, which we can do locally. Food systems is definitely another uh, situation we really need to consider. We're building this resilience. We've got a lot of technology. People should really look into permaculture to understand how it doesn't matter where they live, they can uh, adapt to those circumstances to still create the food that they need to not just survive, but also thrive. Uh, re-engage in your local community is another is another resilience tactic. We need to have community and we need to build these relationships. We are so disconnected from each other, even though we're living on top of each other uh, in, in these urbanized uh, uh, centers. 
um, we really are so far away from each other on so many different levels that it's almost an act of rebellion to reconnect with each other and build those those community relationships. Now, the question I was going to, sorry about the ramp, um, uh, Greg, but I just wanted to quickly move on to that last question which was uh, that I wanted to ask, which was, do you see us going to a cooling stage uh, uh, climatically? Well, the, the cycles are clearly showing us what we see. Mother Earth can tell us her story through the records of our past without being viewed through the eyes of a corporation or a government that has an agenda. So what I will say as a geologist, when we look at the cycles of the past, the, the warming uh, and the cooling are both part of the natural rhythms. Uh, the warming generally is, if you look at, at the, uh, the charts in the books, uh, peer-reviewed science, it is intense and it is brief. And it's what happens after the warming that is usually more of a problem, and it's the cooling period. Uh, the data suggests that we are moving into a cooling period. doesn't mean that we're having an ice age. It doesn't mean it's going to happen in a month. It doesn't mean it's going to be, you know, something that we all have to run and, and take cover for. But even a little bit of cooling on the planet uh, changes the climate. And when the climate changes globally, it changes the weather locally. So I'm making a distinction between climate and weather. And when the weather changes, uh, and I live in a rural area in northern New Mexico, and we're seeing this now. When the weather begins to change, it means the rains don't come uh, and follow the rhythms as they have in years past. It means the seasons don't follow those rhythms. It means that the snow comes earlier or later. It means that the, the, the freezing temperatures sometimes happen after the, 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 in the spring. We think spring is here, and all of a sudden we get, we get a hard frost, and now the plants are ruined and the crops are ruined. These are all hallmarks of this transition period between the warming and the cooling. So uh, the, the evidence suggests we are moving into a cooling period. It doesn't mean it has to be an ice age. But even a little bit of cooling changes the climate, that changes the weather, that changes when it rains, how often it rains, what the temperatures are, that changes how we grow our food and how we share vital resources. And that changes your life and my life and the life of everybody listening to this. And that's why it's important. So all of these things, uh, and what you mentioned, Philip, localized living is the key in a, a, the kind of change that we're seeing right now. Localized economies, and you mentioned localized food, localized energy, localized services. Those are the key to thriving in a time of extremes because, because the centralized forms of supplying the things we need become more vulnerable in our time of extremes. So that happens with centralized electricity. We've seen that in the United States. Uh, the eastern seaboard was, uh, was hit by a hurricane a, a few years ago. Power lines were down. Roads were closed. And the cities, even New York City, restaurants in New York City that rely upon deliveries every single day and grocery stores could not function. And wealthy people living in wealthy portions of New York City were actually dumpster diving. They were looking for the, through the trash for food to sustain them until the roads could be open power was restored, and that would not happen if we were living in, in this localized uh, model. Uh, so I'm not saying what we've done in the past is wrong. It worked for the time that it worked. The time has changed, and so we've got to think and live differently, and localized living is certainly a key. So um, yeah, uh, yes to all these things, and part of that, that change in thinking, I just want to talk briefly that the new book, Human by Design, gives us the reason to change the way we think about ourselves because it's showing us through the new DNA evidence that evolution, as we have been led to believe in the past, uh, is not our story. Now, as a geologist, uh, I can tell you evolution is a fact. I've seen it in the fossil record for some forms of plants and other animal life. The evidence breaks down when it comes to humans. And what it's showing is that humans, we humans, showed up on this earth 200,000 years ago the way that we are today, we haven't changed in those 200,000 years. The DNA shows us that we are not the descendants of Neanderthal. We, we shared the earth with them. We interbred with them, so we could not have descended from them. Uh, and what is now called anatomically modern humans, AMH, 
we showed up 200,000 years ago with all of the potential intact at that time that we have right now, the advanced brain, the advanced nervous system, complex speech, and the ability to self-regulate, Philip, and this is the key, the ability to consciously trigger our own potential when we choose to. No other form of life can do that. So to consciously regulate our immune system, to consciously regulate the anti-aging enzymes in our bodies that we all have, to consciously regulate deep states of intuition, access to the subconscious, so that we can heal unhealthy patterns that we've acquired over time. All of those things are part of us today, and they were when we showed up 200,000 years ago. It suggests that we are intended to embrace these potentials and awaken them in our lives. And the DNA is the last piece. The DNA is showing us that, that what happened to give us the abilities is not the product of evolution as we've been led to believe. The, so DNA, the DNA has been fused and spliced and tweaked 200,000 years ago. And this is peer-reviewed science telling us our ability for complex speech 200,000 years ago is when the gene shifted to make that possible. Uh, our ability to the, the neocortex that gives us empathy and sympathy and compassion, uh, the appreciation of, of beauty and the way a northern form of life has. That is all the product of, uh, of our new neocortex. It happened when human chromosome number two was tweaked 200,000 years ago. So evolution, as we have come to understand it, is not our story. It cannot account for these changes. I don't know what our story is. But I know as long as we require our scientists and our young people to, to stay within the box of a story that was developed 150 years ago, we're going to stay stuck in a way of thinking, and it doesn't support us embracing the greatest potential that we need now in our time of extremes when all of these cycles are converging. So it all comes together in a really beautiful way. The book is reader-friendly. It's written in two parts. The first part is the science that tells us what those new discoveries are. The second part is how we apply those discoveries in our lives with actual techniques and step-by-step -step instructions to, uh, to harmonize the nervous system in a way that affords us these potentials. So I just want to say that. I know we're running short on time, uh, but I want to say that before we close out today so that, that our, our listeners, to me, this is really good news. Yeah, the world is changing. And we are wired to thrive in that change. And that's what this book is all about. Yeah, really well said. I was going to ask you what you think the story is, but as you said, you've indicated you're not quite sure. I mean, it could, there's a lot of theories around multidimensional sort of uh, intervention of some type or alien intervention. Um, we know that random mutations is, is math math mathematically implausible. And I love how you put, frame it into how we can consciously evolve our souls instead of it being through chemical sciences or other biological sciences working with uh, in the material realm. We can literally go through the process of evolution, expanding our consciousness, and in effect, it has changes on our energetic bodies, our emotional bodies, um, and our physiological body. Uh, as we move through, um, you know this this amazing opportunity that we've that we've got right now. Now, um, I know we are running short of time, um, but I'd like to finish on something a little bit more positive and um, and well, the whole thing is positive, should I say? But we obviously we are exposed to so many challenges, and we need to be real about that and take them seriously and build the resilience as we move forward. Uh, but I just want to talk quickly about magic, Greg. What do you think magic is? You talked about it in Entanglement, and I'd love to know what your perspective on magic is and the practice of magic that you apply in your own life. Well, I'm not sure. Are you talking about magic or miracles? Well, I mean, that could be one and the same thing. That's I, think, I, I, think, I think a miracle is only a miracle until we understand the process, and then it becomes a technology. And I think this is the value of understanding uh, when we explore the mysteries of our past and we explore, I've spent a lot of time with indigenous traditions since 1986, um, the monks, the nuns, the abbots in Tibet and the monasteries of Nepal and India 
uh, uh, Bolivia and Peru and South America, all through the American desert southwest, the Kuandaros, the healers, the shamans, and the Yucatan. And as different as they are from one another, every one of them is preserved in their culture, a wisdom from their time that we're only beginning to understand through modern science. And what it tells us is that we are not what we have been led to believe in the past, and we are probably more than we've ever, ever even imagined. And it tells us that we have this extraordinary potential to live our lives as part of, rather than separate from, the world around us and to embrace that potential. So when we can heal our bodies spontaneously, on, on demand, at will, because we choose to, that has been perceived as a miracle in the past. It's only a miracle until we understand the relationship that we call epigenetics and the science of human emotion to regulate the heart and the brain to create the chemistry to create that healing. So that's, that's a perfect example. It's a miracle 2,000 years ago if we don't understand it. And when we see it happen today, it can be a living example of, for one person of what's possible for everyone. So, you know, there was, a, uh, in closing, I just want to say this. There, there was an author in the 1960s in the United States. She was one of the first environmentalists uh, that wrote the book Silent Spring about the pesticide DDT. Uh, her name was Rachel Carson. And she made a statement in 1962 that I, I think applies to everything we're talking about today. And, and what she said is we only destroy the things that we don't value. And we can only value the things that we understand. So you and I know and our listeners know human life is being destroyed at a record rate and it's happening right in front of our faces. We see it day in and day out. It's only possible because we've lost the ability to value that life and our society is no longer teaching us. We have no longer understand our relationship to ourselves and one another. And I think as we evolve to reconnect with those relationships, uh, it changes the way we think and the way we live our lives. And for me, that's the potential that I think we're all moving to. That's how we become better people and create a better world. I think that's a good place to close right there, Philip. Yes, beautifully said. Absolutely. Um, uh, very inspiring information. Uh, magic to me is just an intention set to manipulate the external world, including our bodies. Hopefully that manipulation process is one of a positive nature, both for ourselves, the people and the environment and reality at large. Uh, but we certainly are more powerful, as Greg has clearly illustri uh, illustrated and explained. We are way more powerful than what we've been led to believe. And we really should need to undertake the proper research and experience to really understand that. Uh, and, and, and literally live it. Uh, I talk about this in my book, The Simulation, which is due to be released in late, late this year or late 2017 for those who might be interested. It's a novel about how we connect uh, to our consciousness and to people at large and what we can do to help bring about uh, new, new consciousness and new uh, activity in the human sphere. Um, and it really does uh, echo what we've talked about today. So I thought I'd just briefly mention that. Uh, Greg, Thank you so much for your time. It's always an honor to talk to you. Always get re-inspired and, and learn something new as well uh, when we talk. And I really appreciate your time. Before we go, do you want to let people know where they can uh, access your, your work, your material, read up on, uh, uh, on your biography and anything else that uh, might be important for the sure. audience? Sure. Sure, Philip. Well, I want to thank you for uh, having me on the program again. We did this a year ago and you had me back anyway. <laughs> so <laughs> I want to tell you how much I appreciate being with you and I look forward to our next time. Uh, my books are available wherever books are sold, Amazon, Barnes & Noble. You can get them online. The website, www.gregbraden.com, G-R-E-G-G, -G, two G's, B-R-A-D-E-N.com. Uh, and I want to thank all of our listeners just for, for tuning in today and for doing everything that they are doing in their lives to become the best people they can be and create the best world that we all know is possible. We need everyone and we appreciate you all. So until next time, Philip, thank you so much. My absolute pleasure. And uh, together we are creating our new story. Thank you, Greg.